Hey, my friends, thank you so much for joining us for worship today. We are excited to present to you another sermon in our series on habits today, how to overcome those distractions and temptations that may prevent and threaten some good habits. Get your Bibles, get your pens, get your pads, and get ready to receive a word today as we worship if you have not subscribed to our page, don't forget to do so. But in the meantime, let's go to God and worship. And my friends, with the aid of the Holy Spirit and your encouragement this morning, I want to lift up this text as we continue preaching our series of sermons around developing good habits. And today, preach on our subject, overcoming temptations that threaten good habits. Overcoming temptations that threaten good habits. Church, the story is told that in May of 1979, a man was flying from Charlotte, North Carolina to Los Angeles, California. This was before the days of U.S. Air and American Airlines called Charlotte home. So therefore, there was no direct flight to Los Angeles. So the man had to fly on Delta. And if you know flying on Delta, you must go through Atlanta to get anywhere. Somebody say amen. Atlanta's airport, y'all, was much larger than Charlotte's and a lot more bling and glitter, bells and whistles. And needless to say, temptations and distractions caught this traveler's eye. One in particular, y'all, was a talking scale, a scale, y'all, a weighing scale, my friends, that not only calculated how much you weighed, but for an additional quarter, it would give you more personal information as long as you kept feeding it quarters. Not having seen one of these in Charlotte and looking past, looking to pass the time while he waited for his connecting flight in Atlanta, the man walked over to the scale, Pastor Rick, put a quarter in the machine and not only got his weight of 195 pounds, but with an extra quarter got his exact height of 5 feet 11 inches tall. He stepped off the scale in total amazement. Intrigued by this talking scale, my friends, he got back on the scale, gave it another quarter, but this time got his weight 195 pounds, his height 5 feet 11 inches, and his exact age of 39 years old. He stepped off of the scale, baffled by this talking scale. He now put four additional quarters into the machine. And to his surprise, my friends, the scale told him that he weighed 195 pounds. He was 5 feet 11 inches tall. He was 39 years old, and his birthday was May the 10th. Shaken by his disbelief, he stepped off of the scale, reached into his pocket to get another quarter, but he did not have any, so he wanted to know just how much this machine knew about him, so he ran to a candy store in the airport, got a roll of quarters, y'all, and hurried back to the talking scale. And at this time, instead of hopping off and on of the scale, he stayed on the scale, feeding it quarter after quarter to learn just how much the scale knew about himself. And he found out that the scale not only knew those initial things, but he also found out that the scale knew his telephone number, his address, uh, his shoe size, and his favorite color. Y'all, he spent over an hour on this scale, feeding quarter after quarter, trying to find out just what this talking scale could say to him. And when he had dropped his last quarter into the scale, the scale told him, sir, you still weigh 195 pounds. You're still 5 feet 11 inches tall. You're still 39 years old, and you've lost your last quarter. And because you spent so much time with me, busy looking at what I could tell you, you've also missed your flight to L.A. 
Now let me come get you this Sunday morning because I don't know if you have been tempted or distracted to the point that you miss your flight, but I think I'm looking at somebody in the house and somebody online who can say, Reverend, that is my story. I have been tempted. I have been distracted by some things in my life that have caused me to miss where God wants me to go. Or somebody this morning has been tempted and you have been distracted by looking at something that was not good for you. Somebody this morning has been tempted and distracted because you wanted something that was not for you. Somebody has been tempted and distracted because you bought something you could not afford. Somebody has been tempted and distracted because you went somewhere you should not have gone. Come on, don't look at your neighbor. Look at me right now. This is confession time. Amen. Somebody, can you say somebody? Somebody who has been tempted and subsequently distracted, y'all. You have walked away from something that was good. Somebody has been tempted and distracted that you have fallen from something that was good into something that was bad. You have consumed something that was unhealthy and you have said something that you can't take back. Why? Because of temptations and distractions. And let me just explain to you, Brother L, when I say temptations, I'm talking about the desire to do something, especially something wrong or unwise. Again, the desire, not the action. Temptation is a desire to do something wrong or something unwise. Let me see if I can quote John Owens. John Owens says it this way. Temptation is like a, a, like a knife that may either cut the meat or the throat of a man. It may be his food or his poison, his exercise or his destruction. John Piper wrote a book some years ago, y'all. The book was entitled A Hunger for God, the Poison in Everyday Things. And in this book, he said, the greatest enemy of hunger for God is not poison, but apple pie. It is not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetite for heaven, Dr. Monroe, he said, but the endless nibbling at the table of the world. It is not the X-rated video, but the primetime dribble of triviality we drink in every night. The greatest adversity and adversary of the love of God is not the enemies, but the gifts. Come on, help me preach this point. Piper says, and the deadliest appetites are not for the poison of evil, but for the simple pleasures of life. For when these replace the appetite for God himself, Piper says the idolatry is scarcely recognizable and almost incurable. These are distractions. Can you say distractions? Distractions of almighty God. They are your basic meat and potatoes. They are the coffee and the gardening. They are the reading and the decorating. They are the traveling and the investing. They are the TV watching and the internet surfing. They are the shopping and the exercising. They are collecting and the talking. All of these, my friends, when they take you away from your focus on almighty God, ain't nothing but a temptation and distraction. And you see, when you consider the seventh chapter of the book of Romans here, when you consider what Paul is writing to this New Testament church of believers, y'all, I am the one who believe that Paul's experience in this seventh chapter of Romans, y'all, is the experience of every Christian in the house and every Christian watching and listening right now. I'm of the experience and belief, y'all, that those of us who have been saved and sanctified, filled with the love of Almighty God, we still struggle over evil. Many of us say that, yeah, we got a cross around our neck and a Bible under our arms or either on our telephone or our pad. We are fire baptized, Holy Ghost filled, but we still struggle. Or can we talk honestly this Sunday morning because I don't want to fake the funk. I don't want to pretend. I want to be true to you that everybody in here, as we say at the corner of Sunset and Betty Ford Road, everybody struggles. Matter of fact, the smile at your person right now, look with your eyes and say, you struggling too right now. Amen. 
We struggle to do good in an evil world. We struggle to stay saved in an unsafe environment. We struggle to talk kind to people who talk badly to us. We struggle to think good thoughts even in church. You see, I want us to know, my friends, that, that we are all made of the same flesh and blood as Paul. And if Paul, the writer of most of the New Testament, struggle himself, you ain't going to be exempt, exempt from struggling. Everybody's going to have some struggle. And, and please know that the greatest of the saints, Paul, as he struggled, we too have a God who can help us overcome our struggles. That's good news right there, y'all. That's good news, especially as we continue to talk about overcoming habits, y'all, overcoming uh, threats uh, that, 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 that can mess up some good habits. I, I want you to, first of all, to remember what is a habit. A habit is an acquired behavior pattern regularly followed until it has become almost involuntary. Come on, say that with me. An acquired behavior pattern regularly followed until it has become almost involuntary. A habit, y'all, it's an acquired behavior that, that you have to go through and go over and over again. An acquired behavior, you get in your car, you automatically put on your seatbelt. A acquired behavior, you wake up in the morning, you automatically put the cup in front of the curic and get you some coffee. An acquired behavior is something that you do over and over again. It's a habit. Stephen Covey says it like this. He says, a habit is the inner section of knowledge, skill, and desire. A habit, an intersection of knowledge, skill, and desire. If you got some habits, you have to have some knowledge what you're doing, some skill perfection in it, and some desire to do it even when you don't want to do it. You see, good habits are things that we want to put into our system, into our normal ebb and flow, so that when we are challenged by the fiery dots of the devil, we won't sink in sand. Okay, that was a good word, and you missed it all by yourself. A good habit is something that you practice so that when you get in the point of being challenged, you will not be pulled down by the temptations of the world. But you see, we have preached about getting into the habits. We preached a sermon about staying in the habit, a sermon about uh, starting new habits, a sermon about when love becomes a habit, a sermon about staying committed to your habits. And today, we're talking about overcoming temptations that threaten good habits. And if you haven't heard those sermons, go online. I want you to listen to them because I believe that your 2022 can be better than your 2021 if you have some good habits. I think it was like this. Aristotle said it this way. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act but a habit. If you want to be good at something, if you want to be excellent at something, you have to repeat it over and over again. My confession to you, Brother Jay, you heard me say it before. I, my, my, my coach, my friend, I ain't calling his name. His initials are Brian Alexander, told me, he says, if you want to be a good golfer, quit practicing bad habits. I'm like, but I'm out here hitting balls. I, I'm out here, you know, for at least... 35 minutes, but he says you're practicing bad, and what you're getting good at is some bad practice. Forget that idea that practice makes perfect. No, practice doesn't make you repeat some habits. Is this on test one, two? Craig Crochelle said it this way. He says successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Successful people, successful churches do consistently what, what other churches do. Okay, successful churches continue to say, whosoever will, let them come. Successful churches say, I'm going to feed those who are hungry, not just at Thanksgiving time, but every Tuesday. Successful churches say, I'm going to clothe those who are naked, not just at Christmas time with an angel tree offering. I'm going to clothe those every time that I see somebody that is naked. Successful people say, I'm not going to visit those just who are sick that I know about. I'm going to 
going to go down the hospital and I'm going to knock on every door in my spirit and visit somebody who is going through something. Successful people, successful churches do consistently what other people do occasionally. See, the seventh chapter of the book of Romans, y'all, is a reminder that the Christian life is always a life of struggle between good and evil, between good habits and bad habits. And Paul understands that the Christian life is a life of war against good versus evil. The Christian life is a battleground where the evil flesh has declared war on a good mind. And what we must do is resist the temptations, y'all, that sometimes try to distract us from good habits. Why resist temptation tomorrow when we have the power to remove it today? See, that's a question that I present to you because I don't want you to get so heavenly bound you ain't no earthly good. Because some of us right now know that we can, pre we, can, we can prevent some temptations that are coming our way if we just deal with some stuff right now. Okay, they didn't get it. If, if you would just check yourself before you wreck yourself, you won't have to confess on Sunday what you did Saturday night because your Friday prayer life determined what your Saturday night was going to be. Oh. <laughs> you see, as Christians, my friends, we need to know that Satan will not give us the freedom to live and to work for God without some kind of distraction in our face. And that's what are distractions? Distractions, distraction is a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. What is a distraction? A distraction is a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. And we have to be careful, y'all, because that distraction sometimes for men is with the eyes, for women, it's with the ears. What you're saying, Reverend, because you do know, brothers, if you don't mind helping me, look at me. Don't look at the woman you beside, but look at me right now, brothers. There have been times when you saw something that was lifted and that was tucked. And you got in trouble because you looked. Okay, okay, y'all too holy, y'all too holy. Sisters, there have been times when somebody spoke something to your ear that only you responded to. And you have to wonder sometimes why in the world does somebody who don't look like nothing can get the finest thing in the community? Well, either one, because they got money. <laughs> okay, y'all ain't going to help me preach. Or because they said something that was a distraction. You've got to be careful, y'all, because if you're not careful, those distractions, in the words of Bishop Dale Bonner, distraction is the destruction of your dream in slow motion. Distractions will take you off your course. Temptations will put you in a place where you will have to confess for stuff that you should not have to confess for if you had not been distracted. Your habits in 2022 can make you better than 2021 if you don't get distracted. You see, you cannot defeat what you do not define. You've got to say, I am tempted when I see people dress a certain way. I am tempted when I hear words that, 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 that please my spirit. I am tempted when I drive past places that I know I should not go in. I am tempted when I listen, when I watch certain things that I should not watch. I am tempted when I'm around certain people that I should not be around. I'm tempted when certain drinks are in front of me that I should not drink. I am tempted when certain Certain cigarettes are in front of me that I should not smoke. I am tempted when I'm around certain people who got certain things, saying say certain things about certain other people. I am tempted to gossip. I am tempted to listen to gossip. I am tempted to share gossip. I am tempted to spread rumors. I am tempted to carry out mess. I am tempted to fight, find fault. Whatever it is, I've got to define it before I can defeat it. 
You see, Paul, Paul, Paul says some things, Brother Grant, here that I, I believe we cannot miss. Paul says three things. There is the consistency of evil, the conflict of evil, and the consolation that comes from Christ. Three words, consistency, conflict, and consolation. Say that. Consistency, conflict, and consolation. Again, consistency, conflict, and consolation. One more time. Consistency, conflict, and consolation. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. That's the world we live in right there, Miss Angelique. And a coulda, woulda, shoulda. And if we're not careful, let me just explain to you the consistency of evil. Verse 21 and 22, Paul says, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. You see, my friends, as you read these words, words you, you, you can quickly see that Paul had a desire and a delight. Paul had a desire for what was right and a delight in doing it. The problem was that he did not do what do that which he desired and that in which he had a delight, a consistency in evil. Paul was saying, the good that I should do, I don't do. And the evil that I shouldn't do, I do anyhow. Paul said, it's just the dog in me. Bow, wow, wow, yippee, yo, yippee. I want to do right, but, 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 but I just can't do right. If loving you is wrong, I don't. Y'all need Jesus. Y'all need Jesus. That ain't right. <laughs> Paul is saying that, 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 that the good inside of me sometimes gets overcome by the evil that's around me. The reason that the evil, my friends, was present in him was evil was always constantly with him. You see, my friends, when we are saved, we, we took on a new nature. Don't forget that. But, but this new nature, y'all, causes the old nature to submit to it. Despite the new nature being the stronger nature, the old nature continues to struggle against the new nature. Huh? Now, I didn't say a word, but your old nature, that's your old nature. Your, <laughs> I didn't say a word. Your nature went there. Paul says the good that I would do, but my old nature is inside of me. Secondly, there's a conflict. Verse 23, it says, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. As Paul matured spiritually, y'all, he had a greater sensitivity to sin. Here's what he said, is that sin did not stop Paul from doing everything good he wanted to do, but it did interfere with everything good Paul tried to do. Sin didn't stop you, but sin will interfere with you when you want to do good. Think about the good that you've tried to do in this year, and somehow, someway, somebody by sinful nature told you you were not able, you were not capable, you didn't have the resources, you weren't strong, it was not the time. Don't you know we're in a pandemic? You trying to go visit people? Don't you know we're in a pandemic? You trying to reach out to strangers? Don't you know we're in a pandemic? You don't have the money to do it? No, the good that you want to do, that does not mean that sin will not try to tempt you not to do it. There's a conflict. Can you say conflict? And all of us must identify the conflicts that sometimes try to trip us up when we want to do good. The conflicts that come sometimes try to sabotage our good habits. The conflicts that sometimes try to help us think that we are better than who we are. One of the things I confess of, y'all, is that I never get too big that I forget where I come from. Huh? 
I don't want to get selective amnesia and forget that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I, I don't want to ever get so proud that I forget that God made a way out of nowhere. I, I don't want to ever get so consumed by what I'm driving or what I'm wearing or where I'm living that I know that God made it possible. As God gives, God takes away. But blessed be the name. Is there anybody in here that's want to give God a praise shout right there that you don't forget that you still remember that you have your mind stayed on Jesus, that you know if it had not been for the Lord on your side, you wouldn't be alive right today. Come on, give him a hallelujah shout right there that even in the midst of the conflicts of life, I still hold on. I still got my faith. I still got my joy. I still got my shout. I still got my praise. You've got to realize, y'all, is that, that, that Paul is letting us know in the text. He's letting his readers know that the source of his sin is no longer the inner man. The inner person was now saved and sanctified. That's why we have to see, please sing that song with James Cleveland. Say, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. I'm still working on me. I'm still trying to cross some T's and dot some I's. I'm still trying to move away from some sinful stinking thinking. I'm still trying to break some habits. I'm still trying to put on my full armor of the Lord. I'm still trying to get my mind right, my heart right. I'm still trying to get myself right in the Lord. You see, distraction is the enemy of discipleship. And if we're not careful, we will look at the enemy, and the enemy is the one we ought to be us along with. The enemy ought to be the one that we are beside. The enemy ought to be the one that we understand our purpose. Quit fighting your enemy. It might be the one God calls you not to fight against, but to fight for. You see, Paul found himself uh, uh, sometimes in a prison of the law of sin. He was sometimes a prisoner of the principle of evil. And my friends, again, quoting my friend Greg Rochelle, he says, if your enemy can't destroy you, he will distract you. Do you know that unfortunately, more people have died from taking selfies than they, than they could from being struck by lightning. You know how we do it. Come on, Myrtle. Bring the baby close to me. Stand back. Bring right here on the edge. Right here. Come a little bit closer. Now off the cliff. Selfie in the car. You driving 70 miles an hour. You want to take a selfie? Walking down the street and walk off the we all get selfie. People have died with this again. If your enemy can't destroy you, he will distract you. Paul says, who will free me from this life of sin? Who will help me get over the domination of sin? Paul says, thank God the answer is Jesus Christ. Thank God my struggle. It's over when I give it to the hand of the Lord. Thank God I don't have to stay on the battle by myself. I got a friend in Jesus. Thank God he is Paul. Paul saw that the only deliverance was in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ delivers from the guilt of sin and the power of sin. That's the consolation. Let me, let me give it to you quickly. The, the, the devil threatens good habits by one, destroying identity, messing with your rhythm, and counterfeit and confusion. Let me give it to you quickly. Here it is, Brother Jay. Recognize that how does the devil do it? Distract your identity. The devil wants you to think you're something other than what you are. The devil will tell you you can't do it. And the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. The devil says, it's not possible. The Bible says, all things are possible to those who believe. The devil says that you can't make it. The Bible says, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches in glory. 
The devil distracts you by messing with your rhythm. It makes you try to be quicker than what you are and slower than what you should go. The devil tries to make you stay when you are to move. He tries to make you move when you are to stay. And somebody right now, I want you to go back to that relationship. Go back to that job. Go back to that situation. Don't you get distracted. Don't you focus on the wrong thing. You focus that God has placed you there for this time, for this season, for this moment. God has something in front of you that you and only you can do. God has placed it in your heart. Don't you give up. You too legit to quit. Well, that ain't on the paper, but I just felt like saying it. Amen. Here's the last thing that the devil distracts you with a counterfeit. Shout counterfeit. You know he ain't no good for you. But he had counterfeit muscles. And trust me, when they get 60, they got from muscles to mush. You know she ain't no good for you. You don't believe me? Them eyelashes are going to fall off. Counterfeit. You know he can't afford that. He got a 300 beacon score driving around in an $800 a month car and can't even pay the $4 gallon gas. He ain't no, that's counterfeit. Here it is, how to overcome temptations to break some good habits. Here's the word, no, say no. Okay, that's it, so again, I, I'm, I didn't go, mean to go deep. Here's what you do, say no. No, 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 no. A distraction, no. Temptation, no. Looks good on the outside, no. Grass is greener, no, no, no. No, 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 no. Uh, how, how do you counter the, the, the temptations of a, the threat and a good habit? Say yes. Yes to the priorities of God. Yes to God's will. Yes to God's service. Yes to God's presence. Yes to God's calling. Yes to God's commands. Yes to God's invitation. Whatever it takes, you need to say yes. Say yes. Okay, here we go. Here we go quickly. Here it is. Obstacles, y'all, sometimes will make you obsess with the opposite side of opportunity. Obstacles, focusing on the wrong thing, will make you obsess with the opposite side of opportunity. Why you say that, Reverend? Because if opportunity's on this side, then trouble might be on that side. But you don't focus on the trouble, you focus on the, okay. All right, here's I'm on close. I, I remember being fascinated, Brother David, by going to see the circus, Ringling Brothers and Barnaby Bailey Circus. And they would have the elephants, the lions, the tigers, and bears. Oh, my. They had the cotton candy. They, they had the bells and whistles. But, but really fascinating me, Brother L, was the, the lion trainer. The lion trainer, y'all, all he had in his hand was a whip and a stool, a stool. And I figured, why in the world would this lion be fearful of a whip and a stool? But you got to realize what happened, y'all, is that the lion trainer knew the crack of the whip would get the lion's attention. But it's only the stool that would distract him. And you see, the four legs of the stool were just enough distraction that the lion didn't know what was coming at him. The enemy was a lion trainer, but the lion focused on the stool and bowed down to the stool and didn't focus on the lion. You missing your shout right there. The distraction, y'all, was the four legs of the stool. It kept turning in your face. It kept moving in your spirit. It kept knocking on your door. It kept, kept tweaking you, tweaking you, and ticking you, and, and calling you up. That, 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 that stool kept on turning. It said, this ain't the job for you, even though you had stayed there for so many years. It says, this is not the place for you to live, if, even though you had family and friends there. This is not the person for you to stay with, even though they had gotten you out of jail, gotten you off of drugs, gotten your life back together and you wanted to leave them, come on, waiting to excel. This is not the person I want to stay with. You were focusing on those four legs on the stool. 
And, 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 and what this text helps me understand, y'all, if you don't focus on the four legs of the stool and you focus on what God wants you to do, you will not get distracted. <laughs> See, what you do in your private life impacts your public life. How you live and what habits you have privately helps you get to verse 24 and 25. And Paul says, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin? And I think Paul just was, was leaning a little bit, Dr. Monroe on Andre Crouch. But he wanted to say, oh, it is Jesus. Oh, it is Jesus. Is Jesus in my soul? For I have touched the hem of his garment, and he has made me whole. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us for worship. Hopefully this sermon was impactful and made a difference in your life. Be sure to subscribe to our channels, but most importantly, share this word with somebody else. You know, we love you. We want the very best for your spiritual journey. So thank you again for being a part of the C.N. Jenkins Memorial Presbyterian Church. This is Pastor Cannon wishing you a wonderful and a marvelous day.